My name is Jill Coyle, and from years of experience as a divorce attorney, I know for a fact that no one dies from divorce. The experts and I are here to show you how to not only survive, but thrive during the most difficult times. Welcome to another episode of No One Dies From Divorce. I'm excited for our topic today, setting boundaries beyond the decree. And I'm sure a lot of you hear that and think, oh, that's so impossible. How are we going to do that? But that is why my good friend and guest, Ben Farmer, is on the podcast today. Welcome to the show, Ben. Hey, thanks so much, Jill. I appreciate it. So let me introduce Ben a little bit. So he believes people are fascinating. I tend to agree with you on some aspects, but Ben grew up in Cache Valley and didn't have a lot of contact with people. There were plenty of hay bales, though he was dedicated the second half of his life to sitting with people who are navigating some of the most challenging aspects of their lives. He has extensive experience in accompanying people on their journeys through anxiety, depression, various traumas, and relationship issues. Ben has a unique insight into the medical and EMS communities. He has worked with medical professionals over the last eight years and has developed a strategy to efficiently work with this population. Currently, he runs his own private practice, helping families, children, and adults work through the traumas of life and find health and healing on the other side. So Ben, that's why you're on the show. I think that you're going to add be able to lend a lot of insight for our, um, our listeners and what they're going through and give a lot of great advice to help them through it. So, well, I hope to be able to do that. So Ben, I wanted to know a little bit about your background. So kind of talk about like what brought you forward to want to do what you're doing and, and kind of what got you here. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, um, <clears throat> I grew up in Cache Valley, so tiny little farming community, um, milk cows growing up, didn't really have a ton of, um, I guess, contact with like the real world as people would, you know, kind of describe it and stuff. And then um, decided to go to Utah State University. And as I was going through my bachelor's degree in psychology, I figured out pretty quick that I would need to get a graduate degree if I wanted to continue to work in that field, just because a bachelor's really doesn't give you much opportunity for that interpersonal, you know, interaction. And so I initially, excuse me, was going to go into school psychology. And then I had a friend who was a teacher and they were like, you know what, like school psychologists, they're kind of run ragged. They have, you know, 50, 60 kids to test and assess and come up with plans with. Um, And it's a really, really hard job. And they're like, I don't want to dissuade you, but I just want you to know what you're getting into. (laughs) And at that same time, I was doing um, some volunteer work with a a fifth and a fourth grader at an elementary school up in Ogan, who they just kind of had some behavioral issues. They had some, um, some learning disabilities and stuff like that. And so I would help them do homework after school. And um, I had one of the families was like super involved and they got to know me and they were asking me like, how's he doing? I'd meet with them two, two or three times a week. And the other family never even talked to me once. Like, like here is this random guy working with their kid and they don't know anything about me. Mm -hmm. And so it was really like, I was just kind of like, wow, like, cause the kid that the family was involved, I was like, okay, like I could see myself being a parent like this, being like, Hey, you know, who are you? What's going on? And at the same time, I had a class called family crisis interventions. And it was all about just like, systems, family systems, and and how relationships get built and how relationships perpetuate and all these different things. And it was so exciting to me. And the professor of that class was the program director for the marriage and family therapy program up at USU. And so I said, you know what? And I came home one day and I was talking to my wife and I said, I think I still want to go to grad school, but I think I want to do this now. I think I want to be a family therapist. And she was like, okay. Like she, she was like, that sounds great. And um, so finished up my bachelor's degree, got accepted into a couple different programs, somewhere across the country and somewhere close to home. We decided to stay at Utah State. And so did that, it was a two and a half year program. And um, I just really firmly believe that if, you know, meaningful change is gonna happen in people's lives, like families and their support systems have to be part of that change. And so that's part of why I do the things that I do. 
That's awesome. I, my mom is in LCSW and owns a therapy office. So I have a lot of experience with, um, you know, counseling, not just personally, because everybody that, that listens to my show knows that I believe in counseling and the benefits from it. But also I have that on, you know, just having a parent who is, you know, thoroughly involved with that. So, um, so when you say that people are fascinating, like, like what about people would you say is fascinating? So, um, I, I'm just having a couple different thoughts there. Like you're talking about your growing up with your mom, or maybe you didn't grow up with your mom, who's an LCSW, but a lot of times I feel kind of bad for my kids because they're like, oh, my dad's a therapist. My dad does this. And like, they, they, we have these different conversations and stuff. And so to the fascinating point, I, I just think everyone has such a unique story to tell. And, and as those stories develop, like I'd like to know, you know, kind of the details, the nitty gritty things that they remember, the, the things that they've overcome, the things that they, that scare them. Like I want to mm-hmm. know people as a, as a whole package. Yeah. And And I like people too. Um, you know, both of our jobs are fully engulfed in dealing with people in, you know, and I feel like probably 80% of my job as a divorce attorney is being a therapist anyways, helping people understand, um, you know, that emotions and the anger and the sadness is, you know, very, very real and okay. And, you know, helping them understand that, you know, this process they're, they're going through is tough and helping them, you know, get through that through the other side. But, um, I say this all the time. I am really expensive to be your therapist (laughs) and they are, and I was not trained in therapy. I, you know, did political science and (laughs) I um, went to law school. So though I am, I feel through my background with my mom, through, um, you know, just my job and a lot of training I've done since, I feel like I have a lot of skills that maybe are, you know, lent to therapists, Mm -hmm. but I tell my clients all the time, you need therapy, personal therapy. So I kind of want to talk about that. Like, first of all, why is therapy important for just the individual, no matter what you're going through. Right. Right. One of the things I tell people, cause I'll, you know, <clears throat> being in marriage and family, I kind of bias towards like, okay, let's save this relationship. If we can, mm-hmm. a lot of people I work with are divorcing or divorced. And so one of the things I try and help them remember is like this person you are, especially if there's kids involved, you have some kind of relationship with them like divorce isn't going to erase that. And so Mm -hmm. you need to kind of like explore that a little bit for yourself. Um, I've seen a few people do divorce really, really well. And from my perspective, it requires a level of honesty that is really hard to get to on your own. You know, when, because our support system is supposed to be on our side. They're supposed to be our team. But sometimes your team doesn't necessarily help you in the way that would be beneficial. And so- being able to talk to someone who's unbiased, being able to <clears throat> talk to someone who can call you out, you know, and it's not personal. Like you don't have any of that baggage. You don't have any of that history of like, you know, like, let's say you're divorcing and your mom's like, well, I always told you that guy was so-and-so or such and such. And it's like, uh, you know, you're going to be hesitant to even engage in that conversation because you don't want to feel all that blame and shame that's layered in your relationship with your mom, like then you're talking about that. You're not even talking about you and your divorce anymore. And so right. it's, it's recognizing that like to sort through these things, I, you need a safe space. You need somewhere mm-hmm. that, that can, you know, kind of unpack that stuff and you won't feel judged. You won't feel blamed. It's like, let's just take some time and, and kind of explore all the different emotions. I mean, oh man, I have a few families that have come in you know, it's like, they're asking for this in our divorce decree. And it makes me so mad. And that, you know, they're just going off for the first 20, 25 minutes of a session. And if, you know, if you're talking about an attorney's fees, like that's a lot of expensive venting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whereas, you know, with, especially now with, um, I'm trying to remember the term 
parity within the healthcare community. Mm-hmm. Mental, a lot of mental health stuff is covered and your insurance, most insurances are pretty decent about the mental health coverage that's out there. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing about a therapist. Like a lot of people, you know, you see therapists on TV and you think that they're just there to sit there and like nod their head and say, so how does that make you feel? You know, that's how like the movies and TV makes it seem. Exactly. So you think that you're just going to go there and you're just going to have somebody actually just listening and not really giving um, valid advice, but that's not true at all. I mean, therapy is the place where you learn coping skills, you learn emotions, you under, you start to understand why this makes you angry or, you know, Hey, maybe this is a trigger and therefore we need to get rid of the ability to be triggered. You know, there's so much more into therapy. And I wanted to talk about like, to your point of, um, of somebody, you know, to vent to you or to like be on your side. But then there's also those, like a therapist, a good therapist is going to also call you out on what your issues are. I remember when my husband and I started going to marriage counseling early into our marriage, I've told this story quite a few times, but it, it makes a valid point. We went to marriage counseling for the first time and I was so excited finally to get my husband in counseling. Cause I thought that counselor was going to give him a schooling. I thought for the first time, somebody was going to say, you need to be doing this, this, and this, and Jill's right. And you're wrong. And I was going to be validated. And I went into that counseling session and we kind of talked about these grievances and these issues. And that therapist looked at me and said, Jill, what are you doing to fix this problem? Because the only person that has set this expectation on your husband is yourself. Uh, I just remember thinking, I hate you. I don't ever want to come back to therapy. (laughs) But, But it was like the moment in my marriage where I actually sat back and I look back now and I was like, if that therapist wouldn't have done that exact thing, my husband and I would have been divorced. We, because I would have never turned around to think, what can I do? And now I sit in this world of teaching people how to thrive through divorce by specifically telling them that if you are setting expectations that your spouse can never meet, the only person that's going to ever be disappointed is yourself. And I live by that Uh because when I'm disappointed, when my, you know, something's really, really frustrating in my marriage, the first thing I'm thinking is something's, something's wrong with me. Like, what am I doing? that I am getting so worked up about this. And, you know, and then it goes down through this list of things that I've talked about. Like, are you communicating that to your spouse? Are you, you know, does he even know what you're expecting? Because heaven forbid, he's not going to be able to do what you need. So, so when you say that, I love that because that's what therapy is. Like they're calling you out on your crap. But the other great thing about a therapist, and I wanted to talk to you about this, they're your advocate. A therapist is not there to decide if you're telling the truth, right? That's not their job. So they're going to listen to you. They're going to hear what you are saying. They're going to hear your truth, whatever version it is. And then they're going to help you work through that. So, so Ben, talk about the importance of therapy in being able to help people kind of settle in their truth. And then just like you said, be called out on, you know, their crap. Yeah, it's, it's really funny. There's a, um, I just worked with this one couple and um, we got done with the session and the wife said almost exactly what you said of like, (laughs) like, I really, she's like, I really like that you, you know, like you listen to my husband and you validate what he says, but, but then you listen to me and, and you validate what I say, but like, who's right? Like, who's right? And I was like, oh, that's really simple. You're both wrong. And she just got, she's like, kind of looked like, wait a second. And then I said, the dynamics you guys bring together is part of the reason why the conflict happens and conflict is okay. Conflict is inevitable. Mm -hmm. But if you guys keep having the same conflict over and over again, what does that tell you about what you're doing? You're not either, you're not listening to your spouse or um, you're not being fully open and honest about what's going on with you. And so it kind of gave him something to think about. I haven't met with him post that, you know, Hey, you're both wrong kind of calling out moment. (laughs) Um, 
remind me again how you asked your question. I'm sorry. I'm kind of. Oh, no, no, no. I was just talking about like the importance of this, especially when you're going through trauma. So obviously we're talking about divorce because I'm a divorce attorney and this is called no one dies from divorce. And a lot of people don't want to think divorce is trauma, but it is exactly that it's trauma. And it's likened to as hard as if you, you know, have to experience real death. Right. right. Um, Sometimes harder because at least death is final. You, Mm -hmm. you know, that it's final and you're able to then cope with that. Whereas divorce never seems final because a lot of times you don't have the questions answered. You don't know why this went this way. And so you're dealing with this trauma. So I was just like, what is the, why is it so important then to understand that? And then to utilize things like counseling to kind of help you through that trauma. I think one of the pieces to it is to recognize like the the different and emotions and experiences you have are within that normal range of the experience. So you're not mm-hmm. like, oh my gosh, I'm going crazy. Like, you know, I'm crying every 10 minutes on Thursday. And then Friday, I'm like so stoked that I get to be single again. And then Saturday, I'm like, holy crap, I don't ever want to do these dating sites. Please just let's go back <laughs> to the way everything was before. Like, right. like you gonna are going to be on this roller coaster of emotions. And so to normalize that and say, hey, like, you can kind of expect that to happen. Um, your journey is going to be your journey, but a lot of people have had a similar journey. And so we can learn from them. We can recognize like some of the things maybe to expect um, and, and kind of coming back to that honesty piece with yourself of like, okay, what, what is going on with me in this moment? You know, the sadness, the, the grieving, the, I, like I had one couple um, really strongly considering divorce. And at that state, you know, a lot of people are like, well, it has to be about the relationship and they have to be madly in love with each other for this to work. And like the wife really was frustrated with her husband. Like she didn't really like him that much, but they had some kids together, some blended kids. And she was like, I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose this family. And sometimes that's enough to get you through to the other side of like, okay, we'll figure that stuff out. Um, but recognizing that, that loss and um, fear and, you know, we usually don't make the best decisions when we're surrounded by just a ton of emotions. And so I sometimes liken therapy to like a pressure relief valve, you know, it's somewhere where you can kind of like decompress, get some things out. Um, but, but that consistent check-in with somebody can serve like so many different purposes, depending on where you're at in that ride. You know, I mean, yeah. you anticipate if, if things are going to go to trial or if things are going to go to mediation, or, you know, if I ask for this, does that seem like too much? And they kind of have to work through, you know, their different issues within those divorce decrees and, and all the, just the complexities of divorce. Like yeah. they're so complex and people just think it's like as simple as like, you know, it's like the, the Michael Scott scene on when he declared bankruptcy on the office. And it's like, that's, that's not what it is. Like I declare bankruptcy, right? Like you may decide to get divorced and then comes everything else. And yeah. that can look a lot of different ways. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, so my first chapter in my book is, you know, the questions you should be asking when to save your marriage, because mm you know, if you can't articulate the reasons why you're getting a divorce, that could be a problem because if you can't articulate it, then you clearly have not talked about it with your spouse. A lot of times we're just, you know, men and women just communicate different, um, in, in just the way that we do. And my husband and I are so different in the way that we communicate. I'm very emotional. I get very charged. I want to talk about it now and I want to deal with it now. And he is very, very methodical words matter to him. So when I'm screaming mean things at him, just because I want to get it off my chest, you know, I can be done with it and move on. And he's sitting over here stewing over it because those words, you know, were like daggers to him. So we really need to be sitting down and you need to be asking these questions. Like, why do I want a divorce? What's going on in our marriage? Why am I feeling this way? What am I doing, you know, to, to continue in this cycle? Um, because those are really important. Um, I'm with you, Ben, like I'm a divorce attorney, but I'm not pro divorce. Like if Mm. you're, you have a possibility of saving your marriage, I'm going to be the first, you know, person cheering you on. 
one of the things I wanted to talk about is why your friends and family are not good therapists. <laughs> and, uh. and, and obviously, I mean, the, the first thing is obvious. Your friends and family are always going to think they know best. It's just like when you're having your first baby, you have a billion people telling you what you need to do and blah, 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 blah. This is the way to raise a baby. Right. Yeah. And at the end of the day, guess what? You end up doing what works for you. And guess what? It's right. And it's okay. Um, The second thing is, is your friends and family don't know crap. I say this all the time. Your situation is not their situation. And you can be very, very similar in your facts and surroundings be, you know, to this, to the situation, but at the end of the day, they're going to have completely different results. So getting advice and, you know, getting the, the, they, they're great drinking buddies. They're great. Go out and vent to them. But at the end of the day, their advice is going to be need to be taken with a grain of salt. So So do you have any thoughts of that? Like, well, just between recognizing that, like, like I have another client who, um, it would vent relationship stuff to one of her friends and this friend would give her the best advice. She'd say all these amazing things. And it was usually pretty critical of her significant other. And then she got into a relationship that's pretty hard, um, different, few different nuances. And all of a sudden her advice is changing. She's got a different perspective. And so one of the benefits, if you have a good therapist is they have done work for themselves. They've, they've kind of unpacked some of their own issues. Mm -hmm. They've recognized like, why do I say the things that I say, or what are my biases that I bring into the room? Like I tell every couple, I say, you know what? My training is in marriage and family therapy. I am going to try and help you save your relationship. That is my bias. I try and you know, they're, they're kind of like, well, no, duh. Like that's why we're here. <laughs> but like, like sometimes you get people that kind of want to come in and drop their spouse off in therapy. And then they kind of feel a little bit like less guilty about dissolving their relationship. Cause Hey, they're going to be taken. I care did my of. part. They've got, yeah. They've got, I, I tried therapy mm-hmm. and that kind of a thing. And so, so it's, you know, that again, that, that hopefully if it's a good relationship and it's a, someone who's kind of done some of their own individual work and is aware of their own issues, they can help model like how to process like, Hey, you know, when I've struggled with different things, these are some of the things, this is how I recognize when I'm overwhelmed and just kind of giving people that framework. Whereas, you know, you know, drinking buddies might be like, Oh, are you going on about him again? You know, you just got to cut him loose. He's such an idiot. Da, 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 da. And, and it alleviates that person of responsibility because, oh, well, you're married to an idiot. So it's not your fault when it's like, well, hang on a second. Is there an interaction at play here that if you shift it just a little bit, it would have a different outcome? Right. Well, and the friends and family are never going to be able to like completely understand the ramifications of that, your choice. Like Mm -hmm. they can say, oh, leave that bum. He's nothing. You can do so much better. But at the end of the day, you know, have you thought about the ramifications of an actual divorce? Like are, you know, if you're a stay at home mom, do you realize that that means that that's not going to be the situation much longer? You got to go get a job, you know, or if you're a, um, you know, a father that is the financial provider, you're going to be giving, you know, your spouse money. And at least in Utah, this is, you know, right. What's good. And you're going to, you know, you are going to have to, and then, you know, if you've been married for several years, are you understanding like your wealth is going to be cut in half? I mean, they're not thinking about that. They're just, no. you know, telling you to be your support, your love, which is great. Mm-hmm. Everybody should have a team when you're going through divorce. Um, but they're not the people you should be, you know, heeding to their advice. Right. Um, your divorce attorney obviously would be a really great choice. Your therapist, um, because, you know, those are the professionals that are really understanding the situation, helping you dissect what you need to do to become stronger, to become more emotionally aware. Um, I can't tell you how many people I divorce who are not emotionally ready to get divorced. They want a divorce. Like it, it, it makes sense in their brain and they've gone through, you know, by the time they hire me, they've gone usually through this list. They know what's going on, uh-huh. but, but they're not emotionally there. We'll go to a mediation and we'll be trying to settle and it will be like, you know, fighting over the teapot. 
And right. when they're fighting right. over the teapot, I mean, I'm not going to push my clients <laughs> to settle at that point. Cause I'm like, if you're this emotionally charged over a teapot and I force you into a settlement, you're going to be calling me tomorrow being very, very upset. Right. So I'm, I'm the first attorney <laughs> that says we're not going to mediation too early. Yeah. We need to get you to a place where you can emotionally actually go through the, with this and yeah. therapy is going to get you there a lot faster than a three-year divorce that's going to cost you $50,000 where you're not going to get anything much more than what you would have gotten two and a half years ago. Right. You, you know, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about with you is, okay, you're divorcing because you guys suck at communication. That's usually the biggest reason. And, you know, you just don't like each other anymore. Uh -huh. That's, that's okay. We're not going to, you know, me and Ben aren't going to <laughs> hold that against you. That's not our job. Um, and I do believe that there are some marriages that just need to end. I totally agree too. Like yeah. it, even saying I'm biased towards marriages, um, there are some that should not stay together. So yes, yes. I appreciate you highlighting that. <laughs> yeah. So, so now you've got these parties that have kids together and are divorcing. They suck at communication. They set expectations on their spouse that they're, you know, they don't, they can't meet their love languages. I mean, there's just a litany of problems. Oh yeah. Yeah. And now they have to co-parent. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, yes. it, it's like asking the impossible to, to be possible. I mean, it really is hard, but. I know it can be done. Oh yeah, totally agree. I've seen some couples like totally get over themselves enough to where they're like, okay, we're going to do what's best for the kid. The thing you're going to see the most is, I mean, most kids do this, especially teenagers, they triangulate the parents, you know, they, they go to mom's house and mom's rules are different than dad's rules. And dad, you know, does this or doesn't do this. And and so then the parent, you know, says something passive aggressive about, or just straight up rude about the other parent in front of the kid. And it just, so as, as far as like co-parenting, um, my hope for parents, and I say these kind of things to them is like that you would allow your love for your child to overcome your hate for your spouse Yeah, and, and not punish your spouse through your child. Like I had this one situation where the dad would go to pick up his kid. He had two kids. One was around, I think 11. The other one was around four. So the four, the four-year-old was having kind of a hard time leaving mom and that kind of a thing. So he'd show up at the door. As soon as the four-year-old would show any kind of like, oh, I don't want to go with dad. Mom would be like, oh, well, you can just stay home. And so this guy came in to talk to me and he's like, what do I do? Like, what do I force him to come with me? Do I, do I do this? Do I do that? And I was just like, oh my God, like, I don't, I don't know. Like, what, what do you want to do? And you're like, Oh, I want to pick him up and put him in my car and be like, you're with me for the night. We're going to dinner and you're going to have fun, you know? And it's like, well, you know, would the four-year-old understand that? And he's like, not at all. He's like, I know my wife is doing that though. I know my ex is doing this to punish me. And I was like, yeah, that sucks. I'm sorry. Like, like when to talk about boundaries, a lot of times people kind of think like, Oh, if I set a boundary, then I can control that other person's behavior. And boundaries mm -hmm. are not about controlling other people's behavior. It's about yeah. understanding what, what is important to you. So boundaries are really good to clarify. Like I had this one client, her, um, her supervisor at work would be verbally aggressive to her. And, um, she's like, I just don't like it. I don't want this to happen anymore. Mm -hmm. And so she set a boundary where she said, if you talk to me in this way, I will leave our meetings. And she came back to a session and she's like, well, my boundaries didn't work. And I'm like, well, what happened? And she's like, you know, when the meeting was going as it normally does. And then all of a sudden you just started yelling at me and doing all this stuff. And I'm, and I'm like, okay, well, what happened? She's like, well, I got up and left. And I was like, well, that's your boundary. Like you did it. Like, that was awesome. And she's like, yeah, but he still yelled at me. And I was like, I know that's hard. Like that's, it's unfortunate that people treat other people poorly but like you can't control their behavior, but you can control what you're willing to accept. Right. And so, and so sometimes in the context of kids, you might have to accept a little bit more than you'd be willing to for the betterment of the kid. That's, I mean, every situation is so unique and they're so tricky. Uh, in, in a recent conference we had for therapy, they were talking about some of these family dynamics and, you know, they're like every single husband is a narcissist. And every single ex-wife is, has bipolar disorder. Right, right. Right. And it's like, 
okay, like if you're throwing these labels on people, like what does that mean about what you're going through? What does that mean about the things that are happening in your life that would, you know, kind of encourage you to see people in this way? And so yeah. boundaries, the, the really for me, the big thing is like being really clear for yourself, like why is this a boundary for me? Why, why is this important? And, and if these kind of things happen, you know, how do I address it? Um, you, you see a lot of times they test the boundaries like, okay, we're going to do drop off at, you know, nine o'clock and then it's a school night and they don't drop the kid off till 10 o'clock. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's hard. What are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to call my attorney and they're going to call their attorney. And then it's like, okay, you're going to tattle on this person. Like, is that really effective? Like, how do you communicate? Like, Hey, this is really hard for our kids to wake up in the morning when you drop them off past their bedtime or, mm -hmm. You know, if the kids can roll with it, like whatever, maybe don't make a big deal of it. I don't know. Like every situation, like I said, is so unique, but boundaries are really more information for yourself about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing about that, like, you know, if your spouse is, you know, withholding time or alienating or gatekeeping, there's a couple of things that are really important for you. And that is, first of all, always show up. Um, don't ever conditionalize your love to the other kid, you know, child, because you are mad that they're, you know, choosing not to come. So that means don't text them and say, Hey, I have your birthday present, but you have to come to my house to get it. Right. Don't conditionalize your love just because the other spouse is, um, you know, trying to do that. Second of all, when I say show up, I mean, show up. So every day you're texting that kid to let them know, you know, how much you love them. Or, and you're showing up to, you know, their house to get them for parent time. You're doing what's necessary to show that kid that you're showing up. Now, a four-year-old doesn't get to choose if he goes to dad's house. So if that's the case, call your attorney, <laughs> because I promise you uh, the court's not going to let that happen. But usually this happens more when the kids get a little bit older and they have a little bit more of a voice. And what you need to do is make sure you show up. Those kids need you. But what they're doing is, is just like you said, they're triangulating the parents and they're believing that the primary parent or the parent that they're saying, I want to stay with is the more fragile parent that they need to then like, make sure that they still love them or, mm -hmm. you know, do what they want. Mm -hmm. If you show up in that kid's life, you know, the studies have shown that they are going to come back. Mm -hmm. They're going to come back on their own. Cause they're going to be able to realize that the actions of mom or dad was not okay. And they're going to be able to say when they get older, my dad showed up even when I didn't. And that's really, really important. The other thing with boundaries, boundaries are super important because especially when you're co-parenting, if you don't have rules and you don't want to follow the rules, then you're going to have chaos. Mm. And as a high conflict attorney, we try to set really, really good, strict parenting plans that have a set of rules that are expected to follow. Um, they are there for a reason. And if you don't want to follow them, then you can be held in contempt. So make sure when you're looking at that, if you are going to have problems with co-parenting, make sure you have your attorney draft up a very good parenting plan which is just a legal roadmap of rules of how you and your spouse are going to co-parent after the divorce. It's going to help you a ton and it's going to save you money because you're not going to have to come back and hire me later to create these rules. <laughs> so, um, so one of the things that you do when you're counseling people, um, like, like kids and teens, like, the older the kid gets and studies have shown like the, the kids that have the hardest time with divorce are between about eight and, and pre, you know, adolescents about mm -hmm. probably 14. eight to 12. Yeah. 13, yeah. 13, yeah, 14. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of reasons behind that. Um, first of all, they're prebubescent, so right, they're right. super like hormonal, right. Emotional all over the place. They're not necessarily great at communication because they haven't developed that frontal cortex to understand how to communicate their feelings. You know, you have an eight-year-old that can throw a tantrum, tantrum oh. and you're thinking, why are you throwing a tantrum? You're eight. And 
this the doctors are saying because he's eight like that's right. okay <laughs> right. um you know so and then and then they're getting into their hormonal teens and they're just like all over the place. I mean, oh my gosh, I have a 13 year old right now and I don't know what's going on half the time. I look right. at her and I'm like, what right. is wrong? Why, right, right. why are you sad right now? So I can only imagine them going through like a right. hardship of a divorce. So what are, what's some just thoughts and, and help that you can offer parents that have these kids? Yeah. With kids and teens. So, so that 11 year old kid, like you were kind of saying earlier, like he could really see the writing on the wall that mom was being manipulative and being tricky. And and that's essentially what the dad kind of came down to. He's like, I'm just going to keep going. And when the my four-year-old, maybe five or six-year-old decides to come with me, then I guess he's like, I'm, my 11-year-old, 12, he'll always come with me. And so recognizing consistency, that's how kids spell love, you know, yeah. that over and over again, you know, have the conflict, have the issues, have the, the fun times and just be consistent. For kids and teens, a lot of times, um, I think parents will maybe jump the gun a little bit on the therapy for teens and kids. Kids, they're, they're pretty resilient, you know, and, and they're looking to their adult figure. And this is maybe another reason why individual counseling for adults going through divorce is so critical mm -hmm. is because they pick up on the emotions of the adults in their lives. And so a lot of times parents are like, well, I'll do whatever I can for my kid to make sure my kid's okay. Well, the best thing you can do for your kid is to be okay yourself. And if getting yeah. therapy helps you to do that, get therapy, go, Amen. Do, go do the things that are going to help you. Because if kids have, you know, like you, you put the time in of like, okay, if a kid sees a therapist, even twice a week, that's two hours a week, they take to build a relationship with this essentially a stranger who's well-intentioned and is motivated and, and, you know, devoted to the kid or whatever, but not like a parent. And right. so if you get a parent who can meet that kid where they're at, they know all their little nuances and quirks, the teens and the kids more likely than not, if they have a really solid relationship with their parents probably don't need therapy. I mean, every now and then they might, the biggest thing you want to look for in teens and kids to like indicate if they would need therapy while divorce is happening is if you see big regressions. So mm -hmm. like, let's say there's a kid that's been, you know, doing okay in school. And all of a sudden they just quit turning stuff in. They're not playing with their friends. They're maybe they're getting in trouble or maybe the teacher's saying, Hey, they seem really withdrawn. Okay. Like maybe look at like, let's get them some support, that kind of a thing. But I would err more on the side of like family stuff. Like let's, let's do more kind of bonding with the parents and the families rather than have that kid go in for a therapy session, possibly. The other thing with kids, like younger kids, especially, like you might start seeing baby talk more. You might start seeing more tantrums. You might start seeing toileting accidents, like those kind of things. Like that would be an indicator. It's like, okay, this kid's really stressed out. Maybe a little bit of extra help would get there. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of surprised at how many teens that like they're going, their parents are going through a divorce and be like, Hey, so like, what's going on? They're like, yeah, you know, like they talk about it, but they're, they're not overly bothered. Like the, we pretty quickly start talking about issues with their friends and things in their social life, which, you know, I guess is appropriate too. Um, but the counseling for kids and teens, like strengthen that relationship that you have with them first and see if they need that additional support. And especially if you see the regressive behaviors, like that's a pretty good indicator that they're, that they're pretty stressed out. Right. I, I always say that too, is like, it's not necessarily the kids that need therapy. It's the parents and the parent, the kids will be, will do just fine. If they have two healthy adult parents acting like adults, the kids right. that struggle are the ones that are, um, basically put in the middle of it, asked to choose. Um, and you know, their parents can't be adults. Yeah. Um, and, and they struggle. So I want to finish um, our podcast. This has been really great, but I want to talk about some of my pet peeves with the way people try to use therapists in a divorce. Perfect. And I want to talk about this because therapists are used as weapons or evidence in court all the time. Mm. And you're not supposed to do that. And I'm going to right. tell you why. <laughs> so, so we already said this, but therapists are biased clients or biased um, evidence. I mean, yeah, they're there totally. for whoever they're doing therapy for. So 
They're not there to find the truth. They're not there to talk to you to find out if what you know she's saying about you is true. That's not their job. Right. So when you have such a biased, um, you know, that that you're trying to then bring into court, it's never going to work. The courts yeah. are not going to take what they have to say with, you know, much, you know, weight because they know that they're your therapist. They know that. So if you're telling your therapist he was such an <laughs> abuser, he was so emotionally abused and that therapist comes into court. Well, of course, they're going to repeat what you said, but it doesn't prove anything to that fact. Second, children's therapists need to be protected. Keep them out of court. I do this in all of my cases. And in Utah, it's becoming more of the, the forward thinking of it. But therapy needs to be safe haven. Like it, this should be in every single therapist contract when you sign up a new client is that we are safe haven. We will not appear in court for you. We will not make recommendations for you. We are purely here to help with whatever the issue and the reason you're coming. Keep us out of court. That's not your job. Yeah. Your job is not to be a, um, you know, an expert to come in and do independent. A lot of people confuse, well, what's like a family systems therapist or what's a, what's a parent coordinator or what's, What's a custody evaluator, right? Those are experts appointed by the court to do a specific task. That is an unbiased view. They don't take sides. They listen to both sides of the story. They independently do research and then they can make recommendations based off of whatever the court asked them to do. Totally different. Right. Right. Totally different. They're not your right. personal therapist. Well, and it's funny when the people who come into session, like you can kind of tell, like that's part of their agenda. Mm -hmm. Like they're like, okay, I want this other person to kind of either bolster my case or just agree with me or whatever. Um, but you see a lot of times that they want to meet like maybe two or three times, have a very kind of superficial relationship. And then they're asking for like, would you be willing to say this? And you're just like, um, I'm not sure why, like, why are we talking about that? Like, this isn't really according to the, your issues or your goals of what you're wanting. And then a lot of times they'll be like, well, this is what my spouse was doing. Do you think they have bipolar disorder? Or do you think they could be, you know, narcissistic? And it's just like, I've never met them. I'm, and, right. and I always say that. I always say like, you could totally be lying to me. Like, I have no way to check and, and see like what we're talking about is even Catch us next close week. to reality outside of here. And so it's, it's really curious. Like those clients usually don't last very long because they have, they're some looking kind for of, some. yeah, they, they have an agenda and they want the therapist and they don't, they don't care who the therapist is, but people who are really invested in like, okay, how do I explore, you know, my issues, my challenges, like they'll take some time to, to, with establish a relationship with the therapist. And so some of the things to really look for in that is like therapists that are okay being challenged back. Like, Hey, why, why do you ask me to do this stuff? Or how is this intervention going to help me? Or what kind of education do you have around these things? Like a good therapist is going to be like, yeah, let's talk about that stuff. A, a bad therapist is going to be like, well, I have da, 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 like to get offended or they get, you know, defensive about those kind of things. So just kind of, you know, be on the lookout for what, and, and as a, as a client, you definitely can switch and change things up and find that therapist who will support you. But coming back to, you know, how therapy is used inappropriately in a legal setting, I've seen it a lot of times where like, uh, one spouse will kind of twist the words of the therapist to continue to control or like influence, mm -hmm. you know, their spouse. Well, they said this and you're supposed to, you know, do these things or whatever, or, or be more patient. Or I, I can't think of any specific examples off the top of my head, but I've seen the, those uh, dynamics develop in relationships that get really, really sticky. Yeah. If you have, if you do, if you are married to a high conflict personality person that maybe has a running theory of possibly narcissistic borderline personality, histrionic, whatever marriage counseling actually could be a bad thing. And it could be used as an opportunity for somebody to gaslight you and, or continue the abuse. So, um, so marriage therapy counseling isn't actually, um, 
you know, encouraged for those types of situation, right. but personal right. therapy for sure. The last tip I wanted to give, and I hope all the therapists listening to my show hear this is you should be objecting to every single subpoena that is sent to you or your firm. Like you should not be thwarted into these battles, um, into court. Um, it should be something that you as a practice on a whole say no to. And unless a court orders you to release records, re, you know, go to depositions, release a letter, you should always be objecting. I do this for my, um, my mother's practice where she has 10 therapists and it's become consistent now where she objects to that. And that is because your job is to stay out of the court and to help people. And you are compromised when you're continually dragged back into court from being able to do that, from being able to keep that client, you know, confidentiality. And you guys have it on a, the level of a doctor, like you guys have HIPAA, like you guys have extra protections that, um, you know, are needing to be taken seriously. So I hope if you're a therapist and I know you guys don't love the legal stuff, but you know, if you don't have a lawyer that you can at least shoot these, you know, ideas or questions to email me, I will, um, I will give you advice for free on what to do because, um, I, see what this does and the toll it takes on therapists. And it's not fair to them. You guys don't make enough money. You don't have enough time. And you guys have waiting lists out the door for clients that actually need you or patients that actually need you. So don't waste your time on that, you know, patient that is there for the wrong reasons. Um, so just my last final thought, Ben, like, how, what, what advice can you give to people that are healing from the trauma of divorce and, and just kind of last thoughts on that? Yeah. Like you said, like that loss, like that, that grieving process that people go through. Um, a lot of times people will, will cite the Kubler-Ross model of grief, you know, the five stages when actuality, there's new research that shows what they call a dual process theory of grief, where, you know, some days are just normal days and you're doing okay. And then mm -hmm. other days are just really hard and you have a variety of different emotions. I guess my biggest thing to say is like, I, I really like the name of your podcast. Like no one dies from divorce. Like you're going to get through this. This is hard. Recognize like people are resilient. Like that is, that's one of the things that came out of, there was some um, studies around uh, kids who lived on the streets in Brazil and they had made all these um, suppositions like this is where they're going to end up. Well, like 60% of them thrived. Like they came out of growing up on the street, no parental involvement. There was other kids that they would associate with and like they did okay. They replicated these studies in other homeless populations and like they started to see all this resilience. And so I guess like just have confidence that as being a human, like you have some natural resilience that you will get through this. And yeah, it is going to be hard, but things can be better. I absolutely love that. Thank you so much, Ben. I'd love people to be able to find you if they're looking for an amazing therapist. And are you still up in Cache Valley? Nope. Nope. I, I, my practice is in Davis County, Woods Cross oh, area. So yeah. And I do teletherapy too. So actually my thesis, so in 2007 and eight, um, we were doing teletherapy back then. So I have a lot of experience with video sessions and teletherapy and those kind of things. So basically in the state of Utah, I could work with somebody if they want. Um, That's amazing. My website is benfarmerlmft.com. And there's a form you people can fill out to, that'll contact me. Um, you can find me on Psychology Today, Therapist Finder. So yeah, I'm out there. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Ben. That is another episode of No One Dies from Divorce. We're here every week to help you not only survive and thrive through your divorce, but to re really remind you each week, you're going to be okay and you're going to be better for it. You got this. Thanks, Ben. Hey, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed, please subscribe, follow, and share. I'd love to hear your questions and feedback. You can contact me at community at jillcoil.com. See you next time. I am an attorney, but I am not your attorney. 
Any advice given on the podcast is general and shall not be construed as legal advice.